I see a connection with them. I'm not just a stranger or someone you know say I have to feel the connection. But that's the way you need to kind of read and kind of take understanding of it, to take it in and to, to judge for myself if it if it's, if it's like um, the, that is basically my first question like what, why is long and what is my purpose is how can I find my purpose? That was basically the question I had. This is um, an amazing journey that you've just described and you'll be, I'm sure you won't be surprised, but many people will be surprised to learn that these questions that you asked, these are the exist existential questions, questions about the meaning of life, their own existence, the people ask some point or other in their lives. When people grow up in their intellectual maturity, it's inevitable that people will ask these questions. It may be that some people are clouded in their pursuit of these questions and answers to these questions because they're busy, preoccupied with their learning in school, college, universities, or you know, direct into workplace and work like a slavery to this economic machinery. Or they may be engaged with the pursuit of their own self-interest, their the ego, their desires, going after women or men and what might be um, sort of engulfed in this worldly uh, illusions of love and happiness and so on, right? Why call it what call this as illusion? Because this is searching for something that they know that they can't get it because that's one of the reasons why they keep on moving from one to the other. But once you have real tranquility in your heart by knowing the truth, you will appreciate when you are married to someone that this is what love between the spouse is. You will appreciate the love between the brothers that you have just described, between the brothers within the faith. Um, so it's quite interesting um, the way you describe is, is a natural way of thinking of someone who is sound in their mind and in their intellect. So Alhamdulillah, Allah has already guided you to have a pure mind to ask these questions and to see the beauty of Islam already by looking at some of the interaction that you have with the Muslims. So I would like to ask you if you have any questions that is bothering you in stopping you from becoming a Muslim, um, perhaps take this opportunity to get these clarified inshallah because as, as I realize now, I mean you all already see the truth of Islam. You already see that Islam provides the truth about our existence and gives us the directions of our purpose in life, why we're here, what we're doing here and what's going to happen to us once we die. So having this sense and understanding of this reality already about Islam, the next step is to consolidate this faith properly in your heart and say, I believe in it and I want to declare my belief by saying, yes, I affirm that. This is the declaration of your mouth saying, I affirm this. And then once you affirm that, you become part of the global community of Muslims who then, like all the others, will say, I'm going to now practice what I believe. I'm going to manifest my belief into actions by submitting to my God, my creator, that I know is the one who created me for, for this uh, purpose in life of worshipping him. So, you know, please, Charlie, take the opportunity to ask uh, any questions you may have. As I said, if I'm not able to... Um, answer some of the questions I'm sure I can get some brothers or sisters if they're around who will give you inshallah God willing convincing answers so that you know your journey of accepting and affirming and declaring will be much easier inshallah ta'ala I read some of the Bible when I was younger because I went to a Catholic school, so we had to kind of do it. It was like a big school, but I was young, so I didn't really understand that. So I was naive to make stuff. Yeah. And now when I've looked back and I've read certain things about this young boy and Jesus and believing that he is God, there's so much that points that he's not. And even he says it himself. So when I've read the Quran and I've studied and been told it's not been changed at all whereas the Bible and stuff has how can it be something from God if it's been changed? How can someone claim to be God if he needs to worship a God? It doesn't make sense to me. So we're going to question that I've kind of believe in it and ready and accept it. 
Alhamdulillah. Part of me, I'm not scared to um, take the next and this. Uh, soon I feel like I'm ready. I just wanted to have a better understanding of the religion. And the things I was kind of worried about was just like practicing it. So if you believe there's one God, then that's what Islam says. So for me, it must be the truth. I feel like it is. It's odd for me to put a question to the God. Okay, let's just um, help me. Yeah. Let's um, just explore these two questions a little bit more, uh, inshallah. So the you. The, the question that you're asking about practicality of following the religion, how you'll find it in terms of you know, following the religion in, in practice for yourself. Now look, one thing that you will learn when you read the Quran that Allah does not put burden on people more than they can bear. This is a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He's just. Whatever position we are in, whether we are rich or poor, we are standing or sitting, you know, in, 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 in the way we, we, we walk. Allah does not and will not burden us of the things that we are unable to bear. Okay? So when it comes, for example, to yourself, if you are in a wheelchair, to pray, when Muslims pray standing, you don't have to stand to pray. I'm the type of person, I will, I will try to stand. No, I'm saying, if you cannot stay, stand, you can pray as you are sitting. Those people who are not able to even sit and pray, they can pray while they're lying on their sides. People who cannot even move their hands and their limbs and their legs, they can even make prayer. We pray obligatory prayers even with indications and ishara, like with their signs, with their mouths and their eyes, even that. Because Allah does not burden people more than they can bear. So this is about prayer. When it comes to other things that you will see, that Islam has always given this flexibility and um, dispensation in which if there is some kind of limitations to one's self, they're able to practice Islam within those limitations. So a poor person, for example, a poor person who does not have the physical abilities and does not have the financial abilities to go to Hajj, to do the pilgrimage, which is one of the pillars of Islam, right? They are not obliged to do so because the obligation is only on those who are financially um, able to do. If you do not have the financial capability and the means, the obligation is not on you to fulfill that right or the actions, that pillar of Islam. Yeah? So we are told to give zakat or charity yeah? to the poor who are needy. But if you yourself are poor, I'm giving you two, two examples when people are not financially possible, then you don't need to provide zakat. Instead, you may be the one who are eligible for the zakat. You may be the one to be the recipient of the zakat from the rich people. So you can see how in Islam, even the pillars of Islam, you know, the way we, it is practiced is dependent on one's ability in which they are able to do so. And Allah is the most wise and the most just, and He does not burden us. So, if it comes to fasting, for example, another pillar of Islam, fasting is something that we do once a month. Once a month in a whole year. Now, for someone who is new, you can start learning about this fasting and see how you can go about equipping yourself to fast whole of the day, for example. You can start by practicing fasting part of the day. Sometimes do, do not wake up when you have a very tired evening. You wake up, for example, at 12 o'clock on midday. You've missed your breakfast and you still don't feel any hungry. Exactly. So it is not that that people will just fall dead and, you know, they, they become hypoglycemic and they, you know, I'm talking about those are non-diabetic patients, right? And with, without food, it will be a huge problem. No, our body gets quite accustomed 
to the loss of food that goes in our body to replenish the missing energy. In fact, if you have fat stores, that will be the first one to replenish the energy that is now missing um, when you have no food and so on and so forth. So you will see that fasting is not actually as difficult as some people think. You need to have a good mind power saying, I am going to fast. And once you do that, you will realize it becomes easy and Allah will make things easier for you. Okay. What happens to those Muslims who bad Muslims in terms of your bad practices of smoking, right? What do they do when it comes to Ramadan? They don't smoke because smoking will break their fast. Throughout the whole of the day, they don't smoke. How do they control that? Amazing. Yes, so it is possible. So I've given you an example of Hajj, Zakat, fasting. I gave you about Salah. And the last or the first thing is about declaring oneself to become a Muslim, right? That may be difficult for a non-Muslim to do because of they are thinking, what's going to happen to me when I become a Muslim? Am I going to lose my friends, my family? Am I going to lose my job? Am I going to be in the, in the, in the bad eyes of people? But when people realize the truth, they see the truth is much bigger than family. Yeah, I'm, not quite you. Other people, I'm, other people. You're already said you don't have any problems with that. Alhamdulillah. But I'm just saying, once people realize sincerely that truth is bigger than our families, our friends, our job, our studies and so on, you will embrace it. You know that truth is what will set you free from, you know, this, the, the problems that we are all facing. Alhamdulillah, that this, the first pillar of Islam, is something that you already will find it very easy. So, coming back to the first part of your question, about, a little bit more about Islam. So, it, what Islam tells us is this. Islam is not a new religion. Islam is not a new ideology. It is, in fact, the finality of prophethood and messengership. Finality. That means... This message has been throughout human history from day one, starting with Adam alayhi salam, Prophet Adam, the first human being that Allah created, from which we all have descended. Came up with Islam and all the prophets and messengers subsequently that came after, they all brought the same message of pure and sincere and willing submission to our Lord, our Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and worship Him alone. That has been the consistent message. So when Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he came to his people, he didn't say, I have come with Judaism or Christianity or some kind of other, other isms and so on. He came simply to tell people, submit yourself to the will of God. Surrender your will to the will of God. Like I have surrendered my will to the will of my creator. By doing that, he has become a Muslim and what he's following and what he's asking people to follow is Islam. Islam, as you now realize, is the submission and surrender of oneself to the will of our Creator. And the one who does that submission is called the Muslim. So in that light, Moses the Prophet, Jesus the Prophet, peace be upon all of the Prophets, they did exactly that. Submitted and surrendered their will to the will of their Creator and asked people to do so. So they were Muslims asking people to embrace Islam. Islam is an Arabic word and Muslim is an Arabic word. That's why people are a little bit reluctant saying, is that a new religion like from Arabia, from the Arabs? But if you think about it, the concept is submission and surrender of one's will to the will of their creator without putting any partners to this creator. That is what we are asking for. That is what Allah has been asking for. So throughout these times in human history, Prophets and messengers did, did these things. When Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was raised as a prophet in Arabia, how was he known? He was known as a Sadiq al Amin, the truthful, trustworthy individual by his own people. His own people testified that he was someone who didn't speak a lie and was reli excuse me, reliable in terms of his trustworthiness. If you were to give something, say, okay, keep this in your position. He will keep it and secure it and he will return it back to you. That is how reliable and trustworthy he was. That's how he was known as Sadiq al-Amin. Ruh al-Amin, Sadiq al-Amin. This is how he was known to his people. 
he was not known to be someone who would go and worship idols. His community were idol worshippers, the bulk of it, the majority of it. They would erect idols from date stones, from wood, from stones and carve them with their own hands and say these are gods who we worshipped so that they can bring us closer to God because we can't go to God directly. But as you realize, you don't need an intermediary to go to God because God hears us and sees us without any limitations. In fact, there's nothing hidden from God and there's nothing unknown from the knowledge of God. Yeah, He's all aware, the subtle, the one who sees and comprehends everything. He comprehends every vision, but every vision doesn't comprehend him. So when we say that Prophet Muhammad came with this call, he was supplemented with proof and evidence for his prophethood. Because anyone can come and say, I'm a prophet of God. So how do one ascertain that Prophet Muhammad was a prophet of God? Not only by his character, by his person, that when people heard him saying, yes, God has made me a prophet, I ask you to worship none but God and abandon the worship of false God, it was sufficient for them because of his trustworthiness and truthfulness. But he came up with the Quran that God sent him. The Quran being a revelation in such a way that it's been produced, even the Quran gives the falsification test for it. The Quran says, if you are in doubt as to what we Allah, what God has revealed to his slave Muhammad sallam, then this is the way you can disprove it. The Quran says in chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, produce a chapter like unto it. Seek helpers and supporters if you can't do it yourself besides Allah, if you are truthful in your doubts. And Allah continues by saying, but know that even if you try to do so, you won't be able to do so. But know for sure the hellfire is prepared for those who reject God, those people who disbelieve in God and, and so on, for the disbelievers. So the Quran gave them an opportunity to prove or disprove the Quran and the message of Islam by saying, look, this is Quran from God in a way it's delivered to you. You should be able to match something like it if you think this is a human speech, if you think this is a product of Prophet Muhammad from himself. You should be able to match something like it. The Quran is not a book of prose. It's not a book of poetry, but it has rhythm. It resonates with your heart. It has what we call naghma and you find that, okay, it has this tone that it, 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 it's finely tuned with your heart and your mind. Yet it's not prose or it's not poetry, which is something that they had in their customary literature. The Arabs had prose and poetries and the soothsayer sayings, but the Quran came in a genre, in a particular style. They knew that this is not something that they can themselves produce. Why? Because if it was within their capability, they were able to do that. So even their best poets at that time, it says, al Bashar. This is not the sayings of a human being. This is not the statements of a human being. Why? Because they are not able to match something. So the Quran, the scholars have demonstrated through objective analysis that the way it is constructed, it is beyond their capacity to compose this stylistics of the Quran. So this is what we call the ijaz al-Quran, the miracle of the Quran in the language. But some of us may not appreciate the language and the challenge that he provides in his falsification test. The Quran says, had this book been from any other than God, you should find within it many discrepancies, many contradictions on many areas. So it's given us another opportunity for the critics, for the people who have not yet believed to examine the Quran and disprove it. Because the Quran says, if it wasn't from God, then there will be many discrepancies. And we understand that. A book that talks about history, past, present as well as things in the future the book that talks about economics sociology biology astrophysics warfare the quran talks about all aspects of life from science to sociology and and so on if the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was a human being like them he's bound to make mistakes here and there in those fields He's bound to mistakes, make mistakes in science 
in history or even things to come in the future because human beings don't know the future we don't know the future so if he used to say something that will happen in the future and he gets it wrong then know for sure that the Quran is not from God so when the Quran challenged people to say look look even if the whole of mankind came together with the jinns another creation of God they would not be able to produce a book like the Quran so the challenge and the falsification test is open to people and for the last 1440 something years people have been trying they have been trying and you will see the the if in, in the internet how people are trying and trying and yet they are unable to bring something that stands to scrutiny and saying yes this is an error in the Quran yes this is a mistake in the Quran yes this is a contradiction in the Quran you will find that for the last how many years even before the advent of the cameras we have been coming here